Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our talks with Walt as we are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We now turn to Autumn Rivulets. This is a set of introductory comments. We will have some 38 poems as part of this cluster. We'll talk about Whitman and the clustering of uh, several of these poems as we get into this conversation. Here we're going to find really some of uh, one or two of Whitman's most important and, dare we say, controversial poems. We're going to see the poems Return of the Heroes. We're going to um, find the original 1855 poem There Was a Child Went Forth, which is, for many readers, one of their favorites in uh, Leaves of Grass. We'll join it when we see it to the Song of Myself, Passage 6. We're going to see the very controversial theological offering to him that was crucified. We're going to find the... Um, maybe one of the most controversial poems in all the Lisa Grass to a common prostitute was actually led at the very, be at the very beginning uh, of this poem's publishing to the banning of the collection for obscenity. And uh, finally, another 1855 original offering, uh, Who Learns My Lesson Complete. Now, I just want to pause here for a moment. If you've been studying with us from the very beginning and that introductory word come, that invitation word, um, I just want to congratulate you, and I mean this, because if you have made it this far, and you have been working with us every poem of Leaves of Grass up to this point, you now only have 192 poems left. We are really nearing the, can we say it, autumn of Leaves of Grass, and I think there's some significance as to this, this uh, collection being called Autumn Rivulets. We'll get to it in a moment. Now, there are a few assumptions that we want to make sure that we cover as we begin now this discussion of some 38 separate poems, unlike, for example, the 20 sections of, uh, uh, of Ontario that we just finished. Now we're going to look at different distinct poems, all under a, um, a, a certain kind of cluster title like we saw with Roadside. Now our first assumption is that you've been following our stuff at learnstrong.net, down that left-hand side, Talks with Walt is our playlist, and hopefully you've been following all the previous lectures. Why? Because we've made this argument. We are the stories that we tell and retell. I think Whitman is very much about this idea, and we're also the stories that we decide to accept or to reject. I mean, just go back to those last few sections of uh, Blue Ontario to get a sense of how Whitman's going to make the argument. Certain things are going to be rejected, certain ideas are going to be accepted. I want to remind us of our learning theory, because as we pick up these poems, we're not just reading them to read them. We're actually trying to learn from them. What does that mean? Well, we're always trying to connect new information to old information in meaningful ways, which is why we always find ourselves going, this sounds a lot like something we saw earlier, for example, in Leaves of Grass. This is why we will often argue that the new is the new, the N-E-W is the K-N-E-W. Our annotative approach, I know you know this, but let's just review. So as we pick up each one of these poems, we'll remind ourselves. At level one, we ask, what does the text say? At level two, what does the text mean? And finally, at level three, how can I relate to this text in some way? At level one, all we're doing is summarizing. At level 2A, we're working with themes and messages, and at level 2B, the rhetoric of the poem, not literary techniques, not what is spoken, what is said by Whitman, but how it is said by Whitman. At level 3A, we're going to relate whatever we're studying to other titles and texts that we know, of course within Leaves of Grass, but also elsewhere as well. So, for example, when we finished with Blue Ontario Notice, we finally pulled out and read that fifth stanza of Shelley's Ode to the West Wind, which I think inspires so much of what's happening in Lisa Grass. And then finally at 3B, and most importantly, we're going to ask, how can I relate this to myself? How can I own this material in some way? Now, I want to remind us as well that about each one of these titles, just like all the previous ones, we're always asking in 303 about our big five. What does this text say about epistemology? What you can know. That is to say, either you're going to argue that there's an absolute knowledge. I'm right and you're wrong. The complete opposite is there is no knowledge, which seems, of course, to suggest that there's at least one truth, and that is there is no truth, the performative contradiction. Whitman's epistemological argument in Lisa Grass, we've argued, is what we call fallibilism. That is to say, I think I'm right, but I could be wrong, and it's that I could be wrong part that obviously makes it such an important, an important epistemological position for us. We're going to ask not only about epistemology, but ontology. What can we know about being, and how do we understand being? Whitman will argue, yes, yes, you do have a body, but you also have what he calls a soul. 
some will call it mind and then make the distinction between mind and soul. We're playing around as we look at each one of these with that as well. The next two of our big five, psychology, sociology, study of individual mind, motivations, fears, anxieties of the individual, and then sociology, what moves the group? And as we've been paying attention to all these poems, we notice that Whitman dances between these polarities of the individual and the group, the society and the individual, all over and over again. He defines, in fact, democracy from that perspective. Finally, and we've been making this argument from the very first poem of Lisa Kratz, the last of our big five is theodicy, the question of pain and suffering and evil in the world. Why must bad things happen? It is significant that this collection of poems is posted right after drum taps and, of course, memories of President Lincoln and Blue Ontario. That is to say, what can we do to answer the question, why must there be this terrible war? And how do we move beyond it? And I, we've made the argument that women's theodicy is stop asking why did this happen to us, but rather ask why did this happen for us, okay? Obviously there's a personal theodicy as well, don't ask anymore why did this happen to me, but rather for me. We're going to see this as well played out in uh, these 38 poems as we study them. Now, we have talked about Whitman, but we've commented that there's actually not one Whitman. There's multiple Whitmans, as is usually the case of great writers. We've commented on five Whitmans. We've called them the five P's or five perspectives on Whitman. We've talked about Whitman as person, and his biography does matter. Whitman as poet, no question. And interestingly, he didn't think he was going to be a poet until into his 30s, which is really interesting. And we'll talk more about that as we get into these, is into these poems. Whitman as pedagogue or teacher, I think this is huge. And as we've said already, and if you go back to our comments on, for example, um, um, uh, Blue Ontario, Passage 13, or Song of Myself, Passage 46, 47, he's always, Whitman's always thinking about education and about teaching. We, of course, are going to concentrate on Whitman as politician, and we're going to see this as well here in his celebration, especially of democracy. And then finally, Whitman is philosopher. We're going to see quite a bit of this as well. After the war, Whitman's health, as we've already commented on, Whitman's health began to really take a downturn. And the fact that this cluster is called autumn rivulets, the idea that Whitman started to kind of recognize that he was, he was aging, and he was aging much quicker. We're going to get into this whole discussion about what philosophically does he understand about the aging process. And as we said, influenced by everything from Socrates to Emerson, and as we mentioned, Hegel and any number of other great philosophic thinkers. Now, finally, our assumption is, is that you have your own copy of Leaves of Grass and you've been annotating it, you've been reading it. My suggestion is always the same, that you will begin, first of all, with your own reading and study of the poem and then come to our comments as a way to simply help you move through the poem and even hopefully beyond the poem. Now, we always begin with our Nortons. Nortons will tell us a few things about this collection of poetry. The 38 poems of this group, new to the final 1881 arrangement, draw upon no less than nine separate editions from the two 1855 poems to the four here published for the first time. In between are five of, 50, of 1856, 12 of 1860, three of 1865, one of 1867, five of 1871, Passage to India, one of the 1872 is a strong bird on pinions free and other poems, and four of the 1876 two rivulets. As a group, these poems are devoted to no common theme or progression of idea, and they're also desperate in quality. Many scholars have pointed this out. Some, like Harold Bloom, arguing that some of the poems in this collection should have been edited out. We're going to make a different argument, but we'll get to it. They have perhaps the prevailing mood of retrospective recall, of mature evaluation, and the autumnal wisdom of experience. In short, autumn rivulets constitute a range, not a focus, of the poet's interest. Now, how are we going to approach our study here, and what are we going to be looking for? Well, first of all, many scholars have pointed out there is an interesting progression in Leaves of Grass that moves from the physical to the metaphysical or the spiritual, and we're certainly going to see that game played out here. Think about the title. First of all, Autumn. We've got aging, obviously. We've got notions of reflection. We've got ideas of harvest. We've got ideas of maturing and maturation. Obviously, we've got ideas of growth. That is to say, at the end of the summer comes the autumn. You'll remember as we read from Shelley's Ode to the West Wind, if winter come, can spring be far behind? Well, what happens after spring? That is to say, what's the next phase after spring and summer? And obviously it is autumn, it's the fall, right? In other words, we're going to be talking about the perspective, the maturing perspective of an aging poet, of an aging, and can we say this out loud, an aging nation as well. Can we say this? 
The Civil War aged America as it aged physically, right? Lincoln, as we've commented upon in, in our comments uh, of drum taps and, and memories of, of Lincoln. Now, the second is rivulet. Of course, rivulet technically a small stream or, or a river, right? That is to say, we're going to be commenting on the way in which these poems are a product of something that happened upstream and now is brought downstream. Many have pointed out the eclectic nature of these poems, the way they will draw on all different kinds of, of experiences. I like to think of it this way, and here's where I will argue that we're going to find a commonality of all these poems. We're going to be looking at what, what is picked up and carried on, much like we commented on Roadside. That is to say what is observed, but now what is carried in some ways. Um, now Whitman will start these clusters of poems. They first began in 1860, and so we'll look at the 38 poems and we'll kind of start to see some unifying elements, but again, they're, they're, they're at times very, very desperate. Not all the poems, in other words, will relate to the cluster theme, although I think we can always come back to it. Certainly our first couple of poems we will more easily. We are going to find here a common sense, however, of inclusivity, as we've been pointing out, the idea that we're all kind of in this together, and therefore love and compassion is central to this, especially for the disenfranchised, the ones nobody wants to have any respect for. We're going to see this in Dead House, we're going to see this in Singer in Prison, we're going to see this in Felons on Trial, for sure we're going to see it in maybe the most controversial poem of the, of the collection in Common Prostitute. We're also going to see the idea that nature, and he borrowed this heavily of course from Emerson's essay, Nature, which we've given a full lecture on at LearnStrong.net, that there is a certain kind of propedeutic in nature. There's a certain kind of, dare we even say it, a certain kind of healing quality that we might argue for. And uh, we're going to see this in some of these poems. This compost, unnamed lands, wandering at morn, we're going we're to see that. Now, there is a real debate, as we pointed out, among scholars, whether there is really an importance to studying this section. I made the argument from the very first comments that we made in our talks with Wall Conversations that all of these poems matter because they matter to Walt Whitman. Now, are, are, are some poems lesser and greater? Well, of course. But I like to see it as a unit. Again, a, a, a sustained theodicy. And I think when we finish this um, collection of 38, we will be, I think, better tuned into some of the major messages, some of the major themes. We are definitely witnessing at this moment now, as we are coming towards the autumn of Leaves of Grass, the end of the of collection of poems, there is a shift. There's a shift in priorities. There's definitely transitions that we're looking forward to and we're looking back to. That game is going to get played now. As we move into this very first of the poems of the 38, we'll be paying attention to the ways that Whitman is himself, can we say it, growing, aging, maybe, I think we could argue, maturing, and we'll enjoy uh, the process. Thank you.